Hello, greetings, beings of higher and lower dimensions and all those in between, come one, come all. Welcome to the Four Mortal Coils podcast. I am Bray and I am joined by some spectacular other individuals with lots on their minds and lots to say or not tonight, we'll find out. Uh, So I hope you'll join us. There's lots in store. So without further ado, uh, as I said, I am Bray and uh, I'm joined by uh, some people that I'll let introduce themselves now. Cool. Uh, I don't know what order we go in, but I'll go ahead and talk first. Trevor, hello. Hi, I'm Tanner. (laughs) Yeah. um, I mean, do we want to do opening statements like last time or no? No, it's up to you. Oh, you gotta introduce yourself first. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, uh, anyway, um, you just go. I'm uh, Stephen. This, uh, this is uh, Stephen Kyle. Um, I'm happy to be here once again. We're here to talk about designer babies, and uh, I hope that we have a bit more um, disagreement this time. I hope so. Oh yeah, it was kind of a kind of a jerking session last time. That that didn't end too well. (laughs) Don't say that. That we'll need very to know. Good. Anyways, yes, our topic uh, of the evening is designer babies, colon, yes, question mark, no, question Raymond, mark. As, as the moderator, do you want to define what a designer baby is? Do you? Uh, so I think... We'll uh, all disagree with you, but go ahead. The cru- well, I think that's the point of why we're here. Uh, <laughs> mm. the, I, the crux of what I understand here uh, tonight is we are talking about uh, the morality uh, of whether or not... I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but essentially the idea that in the future, uh, say we were capable of editing certain traits and genes about a you know in the in the process of a pregnancy or even in a laboratory there's a lot of things a lot of variables here but essentially editing the features of a human being so for example we could select uh, you know blonde hair uh, or change eye color or uh, maybe even physical traits or different attributes is that would that be moral or immoral or is it possibly even amoral uh, things like that uh, like do i want my baby to be white black purple green uh you know do i want my baby to have three arms i don't know they're, they're, they're the possibilities are endless i think tanner and i especially will, will you know and probably trevor as well but we should all also consider you know asking the question is this possible um mm-hmm. and i'm mm-hmm. sure we'll get into that as well we we should probably explore explore the space a bit of where the actual tire hits the road, uh, and like actually see what it is that can actually be attained, and what it is that that's actually within our reach, within our lifetimes, and also just generally speaking. Uh, just earlier, we all talked about whether or not you can move black holes. According to Brayton, you can, which is neat, and uh, that's an exploration of what could actually be done. And I think it would be good at some point in this for us to go like, well, it's fun to throw ideas around, but what could actually be what what could actually happen and what just sounds cool. And then I think on top of all that, and then this is sort of related to the idea, I mean, we are leading with designer babies as the topic just because it's catchy and that's sort of a, a you know, a hot phrase, I guess. But also talking about how that relates to, uh, for example, CRISPR babies, which people do exist today with CRISPR edited uh, genomes. <laughs> And for anyone unfamiliar, the CRISPR is a sort of type of uh, family of DNA sequences. And the, we've used sort of this uh, technology to edit people's uh, genomes. Uh, for example, well, what's, what's a go-to? Like, for example, if you discovered that a baby would be born with like Down syndrome or something, the possibility that you could go in and edit the genomes to prevent that from being the case at birth, um, I think is a go-to example. Mm-hmm. But anything like that, like sort of uh, any sort of birth deficiency or something that could be considered uh, affecting the quality of life, because that's part of the debate is whether or not you know, we should do something like that or, you know, right. So, um, so in, in general, in general, 
we should at least talk somewhere about um, genetic atomism and how that's simply the wrong way to look at things. Um, mm, as well, a teacher, right now as a good teacher, time. I'd, I fight against I fight against uh, this misunderstanding pro- probably on a weekly basis at least. You know, I'll I'll be asked some kind of question about uh, how things work in in you know real life. And uh, it's all—it's always with the same sort. Um, and can we can we have this or do we have this or you know X Y Z? It doesn't really matter. And uh, even just today, uh, just today, I was telling a student about the word predisposition. They didn't understand what that word meant. So I said, okay, well, think of it this way: uh, I'm a taller person. I was predisposed. It's evident that I was predisposed to be taller. And they asked me, okay, well, you always use that word when you're talking about genes specifically, like like genetic things specifically. I said, because it's the only word you can use. Right. And then, of course, they asked me, okay, well, why is that? And um, and I say, well, it's because it's the way it works. You, There's not a gene that gives you length of bone. Um, there are hundreds of genes that give you length of bone. There's not a gene that makes a knee. So it goes in in the selfish gene. Actually, he you know he talked about it. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins talked at length about his disagreement with um, Gould about genetic atomism as you know the the catchphrase there. But that's what they're talking about. They're not you know genes don't work in such a way that like one gene codes for brown hair. It just right. doesn't work that way. There are many genes across a large swath of genetic material that code for your uh, hair color. And then, of course, there are competing alleles, and then there are competing uh, genes within uh, families of genes, and, and so on and so on. It's all, it's, it's all about what you're predisposed to do. However, I do hear that there is a gay gene that we can turn on and off. Am I correct in that, Stephen? We are incorrect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, you know... Uh, but uh, say that's a, actually a very serious question. Like you know, even my own family members who have no knowledge about this, they ask me. They say, um, "Is being gay uh, b- being gay a choice?" They of course asked me this years ago, and I said no. And they said, "Well, how do you know?" And I say, "Well, um, obviously I was predisposed to be, uh, uh, you know, gay. But I mean, uh, yeah. so- something something could have happened here or there to to." have a vastly different outcome when it came to growing up or even when I was an embryo. So where do we want to get started first? Well, well uh, it'd be kind of good just to get a general vibe check as to how, where we all feel, you know, uh, what direction exactly do all of us turn and in, in position to this question? That's a good idea. So if it's, if it's again, the situation that, uh, let, let's say, let's say Trevor and Tanner both agree that uh, designer babies are a bad thing. I plan to take up a bit of a devil's advocate position. Mm-hmm. Um, Accepted. Well, Understandable. Case, uh, well, here I could probably lay in a position. Okay, so designer babies, based on the uh, the the claim or or what is uh, a designer baby as defined by Brayton just now? Uh, it's very complicated. It's very complicated. It's not. It's never for me an easy yes or an easy no. It's never a flipping of a coin of a this is completely right or this is completely wrong. I feel the same way with uh, other controversial topics as well, like abortion or all those. It's it's never so simple, at least not uh, from from my position or the way I've seen it. I, I can see where this can go incredibly wrong. Uh, these ideas of designer babies, I could see, I could see a sort of bimodal distribution of the population. That, that is to say, uh, groups of people, a uh, subset of the population who have been designed, and in that way, in a sense, uh, uh, improved to such an extent that it's dangerous, dangerous to all of us. I could see genetic defects uh, swinging in and ruining a lot of people's lives a century or two down the road after a genetic change has been made that nobody could really predict where it was going to go. I could see a kind of a weird kind of racism appear. I could see all sorts of sociocultural issues arrive. But at the same time, uh, you know, it seems so ridiculously useful. And, and it seems like it solves a lot of problems, including problems that revolve around really strange things that you wouldn't ordinarily think about from a first glance of this topic. Like like space travel, for example. We could touch upon that later. Like that, 
a designer babies could be, or just the uh, the act of designing children could be, in effect, one of the many solutions of uh, of space travel or, or the issues we currently have with space travel. So these are just some random myriad topics that we could touch upon throughout this uh, throughout this episode. But like, it, you know, it's it's really complicated, and like you could really go a lot of directions, and we don't really know where it all goes. We have a lot of work to do, and we don't know exactly where this work will take us. And but we do have an idea of where it could go really, really wrong. And I think the way to prevent those things comes after the moment we get a chance to explore them. Well said. <clears throat> I think I'll jump in here and uh, kind of offer my insights since, uh, uh, you know, I decided to host. And I, and I think we'll find uh, as, as far as the, and this is just an aside that I'll probably edit out, but I think as far as, as far as hosting goes with these episodes that we do, I think we'll find that that becomes much more of a flexible position. Like there's simply somebody there to sort of lead the episode. Whereas, you know, because there could be a time when somebody has absolutely nothing to say about a topic, which may be something that we would want to avoid if at all possible. But in the case that there's very little to say, you know, that may be what they essentially fall under. But I see that role being very fluid and not super, uh, sort of hard-coded to just trying to moderate in the sense, because I think we do pretty well. But that being said, yeah. uh, as real someone... quick, number one. Yeah, go ahead. Number one, I completely agree with you. Number two, you shouldn't probably take it out. You should let them hear, you know, oh. uh, talk yeah. of, you know, talk about the process, you know. Anyway, go That's ahead. That's a good idea. Uh, but that being said, and I... I the reason that I say that is just because uh, I will willfully say I'm very ignorant when it comes to this topic other than speculation in my head when people have thrown around designer babies in similar terms. Uh, and so I think that puts me at a unique position to kind of uh, give you my, you know, uh, elementary speculation because it, it, I'll be honest, it isn't just outright, yeah, this sounds like a bad idea. And I am like, ready to be fired upon <laughs> by the masses <laughs> for like, you know, I want to be uh, learned essentially and in, in what the reasons are and why this is a really bad idea. Now, obviously, uh, you know, some of the things that Trevor mentioned, like I even just jotted down like off the top of my head problems with designer babies. Some of the first would be, uh, you know, class issues, race issues, like the obvious ones that people point to. And then I think of other issues such as genetic diversity. If we have a strong influx of people who are like, I want X, Y, Z traits in my baby. And that's the trend. Suddenly we have a large number of our population that all share the same sort of uh, traits uh, that are going to be passed on as well. Unless they, of course, choose something different. It's really sort of a, a, a chain reaction uh, sort of issue. And then obviously there's a, a smaller kind of thing that we don't have examples of other than, as far as I'm aware, uh, sort of the child rearing that's in the upbringing, but sort of things that are decided before someone is born, uh, such as their name, which is technically I sort of, you know, can be decided at any time really, but uh, things that are given to a child by the parent that stick with them. Uh, and thus far parents have only had so much choice as in something like their name and how they raise their children, but to give them the power to essentially design their own child. I, I wonder how, like at what point, like they have no choice in right now as to what genes are given off to their children. But if they could simply like, you know, boot up the Sims three and, you know, throw together whatever they want. Uh, I wonder, like, are we not overstepping our bounds in that aspect? And then just to wrap up sort of my perspective, obviously, this is where I lean the most heavily on. I think this could be great is that my entire moral foundation is based on well-being. And I look at a situation where we have 100 individuals and out of those 100 individuals uh, that are going to, they're going to be born, for example. Uh, there's 100 babies that are going to be born at the end of the month. And 25% of those are going to be born with some sort of defect uh, that is going to severely impact how they live their lives. Uh, so obviously there's a conversation in there about, is this affecting their quality of life? Like, could we say somebody with a birth defect is living a less good or less uh, happy life than someone who does not have a said defect? 
or you know or some sort of obstacle that they have to face because of whatever you know their genetic soup ended up being in the womb uh that's definitely a conversation but in my opinion it it seems that if there was a way that we could go in before hand and solve those issues that would seem to give them a better quality of life or at least better potential to have a good quality of life whatever that means then we should do it it feels like we would be obligated to do it yeah i feel you there okay and just as an an addition there and i and, and whether or not this is super relevant and i i i say that because i think in an analogy to where whenever we talk about god uh, which, funny, funny enough, is almost sort of the role that we assume here uh, by doing this sort of designer baby stuff and this CRISPR work, is that if we step in and take the role of God, I think of criticism that I lay on theists a lot. And like most people who criticize theism is where, you know, where is God when children have bone cancer or where is God when plagues are sweeping the nations? My child was born with some sort of defect that essentially renders them dead in a few months. Uh, where was God with that? And it's, it seems to be a, a legit, a legitimate criticism of, you know, supposedly benevolent gods that many religions advocate uh, and so I, I think about that and I go, well, if that's us now, why wouldn't we do the same? Why wouldn't we step in and say, no, you're going to you know, be born a completely and totally healthy baby into our world and live a great life or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like you know, yeah. We, what you're saying there is, uh, uh, you know, the, what, what I would say you're saying is. You're addressing the fact that we're playing on God's moral level, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, useful to think about that, but also useless, uh, you know. <laughs> because that's your, that's your point. That's your point. It's uh, you, you know, know from last podcast. Yeah. Right. Okay. You, you, here's uh, one issue though with that with that one Tanner. outlook. Say again. Oh yeah, Tanner. What do you got? Well, so like the reason why I would like to hear from Tanner is because if Brayton's the only person in here who decides that, okay, you know, genetic editing is is probably a good thing, then I'll try to help him out with it. Well, I've got bad news for you. Looking at this purely in the aesthetic light and not taking into account the benefits we could offer to people who would potentially be suffering with genetic disabilities, purely taking it in the most designer it could possibly go, I think conceptually this is going to be the rebirth of eugenics as far as the human race is concerned. You won't Mm -hmm. usually hear me take this side in an argument, but I think this definitely 100% violates the sanctity of life. Because just conceptually giving parents the ability to give their potential offspring, any traits they desire. Looking at human history from, say, the 1850s back, we, and that's just, I'm speaking in terms of every group of people on this planet, do not have a good track record with playing nice with each other if we're different. Mm-hmm. Like we breathe that out? Yeah. I mean, here's, who's here's just... another thing. Here's an. I'm worried that this will never be enough uh, in terms of what Brayden said earlier about like playing God, you know, like God yeah. did all these things wrong to us. And and so, fu- you know, screw God. Uh, I don't know if we swear on this. Fuck God. You know, that's like the whole outlook uh, that we kind of have. But here's the thing. It will never be enough. We'll never be enough. We'll, 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 we'll make our babies not have, um, what's it called? Uh, Louis body's disease or sickle cell anemia. We'll do these things. But life is still fundamentally suffering. Life is still one of the primary attributes of the universe is suffering. Uh, like, there is no light without the requisite darkness. And your children will always hate you. You know, they'll always despise you for all the things that you didn't bring to the table at the very conception of things. And, I, and I'm a little interested in how this will go when a child was literally not only birthed, but also designed by their parents 
the imperfections that they will have by default of the very existence of the universe or the very base code of the universe is, is will, will screw them over and they'll hate their parents for it. And that's one other thing. And a complete aside, but nevertheless, I think it's psychologically tenable to say that they will hate their parents for all the things that they didn't do right. Well, yeah. I want to be think designer is... babied with an epidural from the neck down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I never have we to all, feel pain again. <laughs> You just have heroin being dripped in. I want to <laughs> nice. sweat cocaine. That's the premium package. But no, I mean, struggling fundamentally is part of, if not the human condition. We struggle against our own existence here. We... And now instead of hating God, we hate our parents, which we already did. But now it's just brought to an nth degree because they didn't do everything quite right. Interesting. Who's to say what what bounds we aren't going to be pushing? We don't know the upper limits of human potential, and given this toolbox, who's to say we? And this is going to be a very slippery slope of me, but who's to say we don't create some like? Trevor and I were discussing this a few days ago while he was uh, driving through Arizona, because there's never anything else to that do place. in Arizona. It was quite the drive, but, um, driving through Arizona. I mean, have, have it, are any of you familiar with H.G. Wells' The Time Machine? Yeah, a little bit. So, you, I, just going briefly over the, the plot of the story, um, this genius English, I think he was a uh, scientist, created The Time Machine, he travels incredibly far into human, um, the human future. And we, if I'm remembering correctly, as a race, we managed to like ascend beyond our um, our own like our our binds, and just become this race of Ubermensches up until a point where we have like this massive like collapse socially, and then we wind up accidentally creating like this dichotomy where we have this like incredibly stupid subterranean dwelling like mongoloid type race but also like this super intelligent terrestrial dwelling like race of people who like exploit them and use them for their own gain even though they're both technically human like that's the kind of future i foresee if this sort of manipulation is becomes widespread or you know whatnot I forget what's the other I wrote I wrote that down Tanner because that sounds really uh, like something I want to look into but I it, I thinking about media to do with sort of this kind of thing I want to say there was a movie made probably based on a book is it is it Gattaca I, Gattaca I, I can't remember there was some something from uh, back in my school days uh, where there was a movie about uh, and I remember because there, one of the central plot points was sort of the uh, dislike that natural-born people had for, like, genetically, like, grown-in-a-lab people, and vice versa. I, it was like that was a symbol of status, and that if you were, you know, designed in the lab and born that way, then you were... I can't remember which way it was that like you were better than the natural born people, uh, you know, because that was the old way or something. Uh, I mean, obviously, well, I mean, yeah, you're, you're in design. Dude. I, yeah, obviously I get some brave new world vibes there, but I don't believe that that was it. Um, anyway, I, I just want to throw that out there because I, I'm trying to, I'm going to go try and find it. <laughs> is, is mm. that Ender's game? No, it, the Ender's, of Ender's game, game was completely different. Mm. Oh yeah, it is Steven, Gattaca. How do you feel about this? No, I'm interested. So here's the deal, people. Um, I'm <laughs> hearing a lot of pushback from Tanner. I'm hearing a lot of pushback from Trevor, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and help uh, Brayton out a little bit. You know, give us some variation. So uh, I mean, you know, call it devil's advocate if you will, but I don't really think about it that way. You know, th these are genuine thoughts um, that. Mm -hmm. I've had and and do have. So in other words, you know, I'm not just doing this to be a um, useless shit eater. You know what I mean? That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, so here's here's one thing we should really consider. We have been selecting genes in other organisms for a long, long time. Uh, the question on like should we genetically modify our cattle 
is a question that was answered uh, more than a thousand years ago. You know, I love the I love what Carl Sagan has to say to talk to regular people about. Okay, here's what evolution does, right? It selects for these you know traits that in turn select for genes and so on um, over the course of billions of years. And to prove that that's possible, to prove that that's even feasible, he talks about well, just look at the domesticated cow or the domesticated dog. We did that in just a speck of of you know cosmic time as we domesticated them we literally changed their genetic code well why not us why not us um why not select for those traits that we think are better we've been doing that helplessly for the majority of our time as a species anyway um you know we don't necessarily tend to want to say date and couple with people who are chronically unhealthy or, or, or even chronically just plain ill. Um, isn't that a gene selection? Um, I would argue with anybody uh, that it is. It is a gene selection. We try to stay away from coupling with people we don't think will, you know, make genetically viable offspring and so on. Mm -hmm. There also is another consideration, perhaps, perhaps this is genuinely the next stage of human evolution. Perhaps it is time that we wrestled the mastery of our genetic code and decided what it would look like in the future. Perhaps that is in our ability. Perhaps it won't be. There's always a possibility that we manage to unlock a lot of the gene science, so to speak, and unlock a lot of features of designer babies, but not, not necessarily all of them. Maybe there are some things that are genuinely out of reach. You know, once again, if you know nothing, say nothing. Um, we can speculate all day, but we're still rolling with dice. But right. so, yeah, um, hmm. that's, that's genuinely one way to look at it. Uh, we've been doing this anyway. Why not keep doing it? And to wrap up again, perhaps it is... Uh, not our destiny, but perhaps it is a natural uh, consequence of, of having such mastery over science. Mm -hmm. To your last statement, I do agree with you that it, it does seem inevitable. Uh, just like uh, with the, like the discovery of fire, you eventually have like uh, the creation of small tribes of people who can start to live on the floor. Oh, oh for sure. Of trees, and to bring it to bring it to that know? mythical level, if, to bring it back to that you know, God's morality type thing. Once we open this box, it will not be closed. Yeah, uh, just there are a couple of concerns that I have, uh, some sociocultural, yeah, some uh, more more deliberate things that can actually occur to us, uh, like actual, like disease and that sort of thing. that I think need to be uh, faced and uh, understood a little bit, or at the very least discussed, uh, that I think uh, we should explore uh, before we can start to say that this is a net positive or this is a good thing. For all we know, this could be maybe one of uh, like solutions to like the Fermi paradox. Uh, this could be where the extin extinction of uh, mankind is hiding. I think I brought this up last week too. Yeah. I got a real fixation with the Fermi. I mean, real. Look, look, bring it look, up every week. It, it'll be brought up literally every time, and I ought to stop my timer because that's pretty much what it was about. Like for those of those of you who are listening, I like started a timer before this began. To see how long it would take for someone to bring up the Fermi paradox or Jurassic Park, <laughs> it's been 35 minutes. Hey, you know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right. You guys. know what? That's a pretty good track record. That's a pretty good track record, I think. <laughs> I can only hope for next week we'll Team get to 40. In and we've already jumped the shark, boys. <laughs> Hell fucking yeah. But, um,. The first thing I thought I'd mention is the first real issue. Since y'all are taking a pro, I do have some anti opinions, like some uh, some very negative ideas, uh, some things I think would be really bad. Uh, for one, is uh, genetic defects, such as uh, so. There's an actual case. I think this is the one that Brayden was mentioning at the very start of those two twins in China who were genetically altered to be more immune to HIV. Uh, that happened a little while ago, and I know that the uh, right? scientist doctor who did that is now very, very, very deep inside of a uh, Chinese prison somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, had he been stimulant. American, you know, he probably wouldn't Man. be in prison. I mean, you know, they got him Tai Long down there, yeah. or what? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I mean, he's re down there, real deep. 
He's in the pits of Tartarus. <laughs> right. He's lost in the Chinese gulag. We'll never see from him again. I'm that's, telling you. That's he the has final been circle. Emasculated and chained to a rock. Right. The final circle is yeah, for all the people who edited eagle. jeans. There's an eagle that feeds on his liver every morning. That's that's what he's doing. He gave us fire, and now he'll be eaten every every morning for his for his sins. <laughs> it, yeah, but the new doing that. Yeah, he's the new Prometheus, you know? Uh, there, for, first there's Prometheus, and there's Oppenheimer, and now there's that dude. I mean, so, like, what? it sounds callous, but it's like, orange the new black, right? Well, you know, Chinese mm. is the new Greek. <laughs> Why? So, wait, okay, so, because I'm, I'm not familiar with this. So, this guy edited their genes to be more resistant to HIV, and they imprisoned him? No. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, go on. I mean, <laughs> I... I I'm not trying to be pedantic about this, but you have to be. He, it, it, let's just take Trevor's word for it, all right? That these children are, are allegedly more HIV resistant. Let's just go ahead and grant all of those claims, right? So, um, here's the deal. He would have edited their genes to express what we call phenotypes to be more resistant against HIV. In other words, in other words, he didn't like twist a lock and key type of thing and say, "Oh, HIV immune." That's not how that works, you know. <laughs> okay, mm. important distinction. Yeah, see, that's a very fair point. Uh, which uh, what yeah. Stephen said is important, but I think doesn't change anything about the underlying uh, sort of moral consideration of you know. Wh I mean, is this illegal in China or like why? Why imprisonment whenever this kind of thing is... Probably, he's probably some political prisoner. That's just my first guess. I actually have no idea. But, like, he's probably not arrested for what he did. He's probably a political prisoner in some, some way or the other. So he, he just jailed him for well, something completely unrelated? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know, and I don't really care. I mean, he's they're, they're editing Chinese jeans by day and what they want. selling ass by night. <laughs> That's fair. I will well, say... All right, I'm going to have to actually... Oh, go on. I say he did kind of, in medically at least, commit a pretty reprehensible act. I mean, I don't know. Like, what countries on this, uh, what countries on this planet have laws against um, genetic modification? Well, once again, to I mean, you know, I'm just going to keep hammering this point until someone stops me. We've 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 already been doing this for a great long time. I mean, who cares? Yeah, and this is what mm. I, I think about when well, I hear this, like, just raw thoughts, mm. uh, is, like, I hear the phrase, you know, a, a couple of babies had their genes edited for, you know, for Claire, for, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, for brevity, their genes edited to be, quote-unquote, resistant to HIV, on the surface, to me, that sounds fantastic. Like, if I could push a button and everybody on the planet was suddenly resistant to HIV, I would absolutely press it. But we're considering a situation in, you know, again, for brevity, there is a possibility that somebody pushes a few buttons and suddenly people are going to be resistant to HIV and we have a problem. So that's what, uh, that's the mental gap I'm trying to bridge here. Yeah. So, so just to help so, you out a little bit, like, you know, the reason why I keep bringing this up is because it's not an issue that can be brief. You you really have to understand it in order to be able to, to like, really talk about it. So the entire point of, um, of say, Tanner's argument or, you, you know, the entire point of, say, someone else's argument that really knows what's going on, um, you know... Let's say that you had a button that could make people immune to HIV, right? Uh, let's just say, like you say, in brief, let's just say it's a button that we can literally press once, once they're in a certain critical stage of their, um, uh, in, in the womb, and we can just right. make them HIV uh, immune, okay? Well, that would say nothing about what genes you altered, in other words, you know, the number of genes you altered yeah. to have to have that happen, it wouldn't say anything about um, how you altered them. It just says, okay, well, you just did it. Okay, well, that's fine. Let's just go ahead and grant that. Okay, yeah. Well, what's more, then this is the crucial part, it does not say what genes you altered that also code for other things. That's why it's not a brief topic at all. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I that's why I started this. You know, my entire you know thoughts on this by like we should really make sure that anyone who's listening knows that genes do not work in the atomist way. They they don't they don't do that. So it's a very real possibility that if you press that button and made everyone on this planet HIV immune, that would be a great thing starting out. But later on, we, we it, it would be a very significant chance of finding out, oh, those genes altered actually code for, you know, defense against malaria, and now we're crippled, and now it's all gone. Mm. Like, human civilization is not possible in that African belt where malaria is just, you know, so stinking bad. You know what I mean? Right. No, uh, yeah. that's actually really the full swing uh, a p- uh, point that I was going to try to make earlier with this whole thing with the HIV uh, immunity. Uh, the reason why I brought it up is uh, the things that can occur afterward from moving something like that, it could be catastrophic. I wasn't um, not thinking in just like the full, like, let's make everybody like this, but let's just start small and just make two babies HIV resistant. Well, just travel a century or two down the line. You'd be surprised the amount of people will be connected to, genetically speaking, those two HIV-resistant babies at the very well, start of the line. That's, but, you that's know? like dropping oil over a glass of water, or like dropping dye over a glass of water. It'll just spill in and affect a huge amount of people. And then eventually something somewhere could go wrong, and a lot of people could be affected. I'm talking entire branches of the tree of humanity shriveling up and dying because somebody somewhere thought that they could outsmart the evolutionary mm, right. uh, counter. You know, it's true to say that I, I am not a, a geneticist. Uh, that's true to say. So I'm not I'm not very uh, well educated in this compared to others. But I would say that changing any of these things, uh, you do so at your own peril. And I think the further you become educated in this, the more you become extremely hyper aware of that danger, just like Stephen mentioned. Uh, the it, It's not so simple. It, it, you don't want to be too Dunning-Kruger about it uh, and go in there and think that you can do this and be able to make all these fantastic changes. I have uh, one friend of mine right. who once mentioned that uh, he thinks the first thing we should do is make everybody's bone density tighter or, or heavier and make us more unlikely to uh, break our bones, that sort of thing. I have a friend of mine who mentioned that. And my first thought is, well, that's useful in some regards, but it's terrible in others. And the level yeah. of versatility that so. mankind is or that human beings are, you'll never be able to satisfy all questions or all propositions that humans need to face. You almost need to when you begin doing the genetic modification. Uh, to I, begin I, my thinking, argument is that okay, it's well, impossible not to do. That's uh, impossible not to do what? It's impossible not to start asking all, literally all the questions. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, take a look at this field. It's literally in its infancy. Hmm? Yeah, I my mean, mind is racing with questions. I, these, <laughs> yeah, yeah. these systems we're dealing with, they're not just like a broom full of light switches. This is quite literally trillions and trillions and trillions of just compounds interacting um miles and miles and miles of genetic information error propagates exponentially so there's quite literally no telling what effect you could have on this this being that you now have to bring into the world that's why I, I think will, the, I will, the the HIV resistance for the, uh, the the those two babies was so medically ethically reprehensible because he did that most likely without knowing the full implications of what he had done. Oh yeah, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. To, it's impossible that he should have known all the implications. You know what I mean? But but exactly. I will I will stop I you a little bit right there, Tanner. Um, I you know I realize. I realize that you and I have a very similar education, so I want you to know I'm not I'm not focusing on you. You know what I mean? But uh, you said error compounds um, exponentially, right? And so Trevor's also talking about that: how entire swaths of human life could be completely obliterated down the road, and so on. One thing I will mention is that um, you know the DNA replicator. I mean, the DNA molecule is uh, surprisingly um, agile. I mean, you know, like it, it can uh, over over generations, it will correct things, you know, just like as a, as a, I know it seems small, but as a small example, you know, it takes three base pairs, takes three little, you know, base pairs in the language of information on the DNA, right, to encode for one amino acid. If you change the middle 
um, base pair, it doesn't change the amino acid it, it codes for. It just doesn't. And so, you know, I know that seems like it's small, but it's not. Um, you know, you can't say that goes all the way up, but the, d the DNA replicator is very good at replicating itself with little errors. I mean, like literally zero, uh, you know, on the whole. Um, of course, there are errors, but then they're corrected. I mean, there are so many mechanisms that just uh, kind of make it right, you know? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good replicator. Yeah, that's kind of where I ended up thinking. It was almost immediately as Trevor started talking about it, like, say we started doing something like this, even like uh, he mentioned with bone density, it feels like now we're in some sort of, I don't even know if race is the way to describe it, like race against evolution, even though evolution's not in a, a race per se. Like we're trying to outwit our natural evolution, you know, in the short term scale for problems that we have now and try, and which will disrupt sort of the things that are going on like right now that we can't see on the, on the big picture, I guess. And sort of the implications that that'll have, like, uh, you know, for example, if we, you know, there's certain people, I was just reading about this the other day. There's, uh, tribes of people that have historically, uh, lived near the water and they, uh, spearfish, uh, for the main source of their food. And so their lung capacity is much larger and they, they hold their breath underwater for minutes at a time, uh, to be able to, you know, spearfish, uh, effectively, uh, which most people say, you know, in my neighborhood definitely could not do. Uh, and so it's like, say we were, yeah, your, your tribe of people could not do, you know, uh, well, right. And, and so I'm like, well, maybe those traits are valuable and essential for those people, but it, what would it do for, for me? Like, how do we decide what's good for everybody in every case for every time? Like the bone density, like Trevor was saying, it seems like a good idea, but then at another time it would probably be terrible. Well, I mean, take into account all the the bodily functions regulated by bones. I mean, production of white blood cells in the marrow, production of red blood cells in the marrow. Mm. Who's to say that increasing bone density won't decrease the uh, the production or availability or ability to disperse of those things? Who's to say we won't weaken our immune systems because of that and make ourselves way more susceptible to disease overall? Right. Or that we can even support that kind of necessary, like... And things that that kind of bone density would take, like metabolically, you know? I mean, we could wind up increasing our caloric consumption, you know, by like 50 percent or 60 percent. I mean, you know, this uh, absolutely, mm -hmm. Tanner, you know, it could be like, oh, yeah, you know, we need 50 percent more calories to live. Goodbye, everybody else. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to bring up something that Steven said that I really liked, uh, the, uh, that mentioning of uh, the inevitability of the the change in genetics uh, from this point. The fact that we move this direction means that we're moving this direction. We could talk about the moral confines, whether or not this is okay for our current morality, but uh, this is going to sound kind of weird, but I, I think we'll we'll reconcile ourselves with what's around us. When we find ourselves capable of making these sorts of changes, we'll reconcile our or the way we feel about it and we'll change yeah, we, the way we feel about it and we'll move towards using it and, and what we consider to be an authentic and, and proper way of doing it. Uh, I think we'll change accordingly to our ability. Uh, I'm sure there were plenty of, uh, ape, uh, like, uh, pre homo erectus, uh, when we first made the movement over to cooked foods, uh, that were, uh, more than hesitant to begin making that move. Well, that's kind of a weird analogy. I have no idea what a pre homo erectus could was and was not thinking or capable of thinking, all, uh... but, well, the whole the whole reason I bring all this up is, is this. Uh, I think what we need to do is find a way to uh, conduit this energy, this movement into something that is proactive and solves the problems that we think will happen, such as these genetic defects down the line. And yeah, I think yeah, I have yeah, one idea. I'm curious how y'all feel about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it'll happen no matter what, and we need a way of expressing the change while the way, while all the while circumventing some of the innate negatives that will that will come with. You know, I think no. no matter what, people are going to want to prevent Down syndrome. People are going to want to uh, prevent Lou Gehrig's disease, one of the most debilitating diseases there are, uh, neurologically speaking. Uh, it's one of the ones that we go over in class that's just absolutely 
mind-bogglingly uh, terrifying uh, to have to go through. Uh, you know, uh, the, there are many things that we would want to be able to solve. And I, I think here's one idea that I had, and I'm really interested in seeing how all three of you feel about it. Here's how I think. I think designer babies should be perfectly legal. You can genetically modify your child if you so wish. This is your thing uh, that you make this decision. However, if you want to make a genetic modification, there is one rule. We sterilize whatever this baby is. So whatever this baby becomes, they cannot have children. They can't introduce into the genetic pool whatever sort of genetic alterations that you have made to them. You know, you can't, you can influence one child, but you, but by influencing one child in this way, you can't, you, you can't just completely alter the entire gen, uh, human tree uh, in that act. Uh, you should instead make the change, get rid of the Lou Gehrig's disease, make whatever edits you want. In fact, if you wanted to, you could make whatever changes. Because I do think it's inevitable. I think there will be a subset of the population that will try raising the IQ. And I think the act of raising it will make everyone want to raise it. You know, that sort of thing. I think that will inevitably come. And I think that the real only way you can circumvent it is just put these sort of restrictions up and not let it ruin the entire human tree. So how do you but, feel about that? But Trevor, Trevor, it's, it's still the same exact problem. Like, that's not getting ahead of the mm. problem. That's literally that's literally saying, okay, we see the problem and we're doing nothing about it. <laughs> okay. And so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not picking on you. But, like, um, what, what am I trying to say here? Please. If you if you sterilized um, if you sterilized the the person uh, when we shouldn't forget that we are talking about people uh, mm -hmm. if you sterilize the person that will become you know uh, in other words the, this person will um, have some kind of life after genetic <laughs> editing you know what I mean um, so you said okay just make them sterile that's not fixing the problem. Um, we we have a deep need and desire and and things to to have children and to propagate the species. Um, so by saying okay, well they're sterile, you're not getting ahead of the issue. You're just uh, accepting it. Um, you know these people. Well, that is to say, making a new issue. Uh, well, yeah, exactly, exactly. In other words, you you need we need a, a solution that doesn't regress literally at all. Um, because if it regresses at all, it probably regresses, you know, all the way down. You know what I mean? There's definite issues immediately with it. Uh, the first one being that, but to me, it's like, it solves one problem, just one. Uh, there are many other problems that it generates, but the only thing that I'm concerned about when I make this position, when I make this claim is the, uh, is the effect on the human tree of introducing sweeping genetic alterations. Uh, to me, this is what, this solves that issue at the very least to some extent. You can make genetic alterations as you wish, but you can't affect the human tree. The, the entire position of this claim is based around influencing and changing the human genetic, um, the human genome as a as a, as an overall population. Uh, that would be the chief concern of this claim. Yeah, but but still, still, it, what I'm trying to prove to you is that your concern is valid, and you're invalidating it with your with your rule. So, like, let's say that we sterilize these people, right? Let's say that mm -hmm. we sterilize it, to sterilize these people with genetic editing. Who's to say that that won't cause a whole host of problems that inevitably kills the uh, the person anyway, or even kills them while they're still in development? I mean, there's just no telling. Okay, well, let's say that we instead uh, take another approach and we medically castrate these people. Then they have no growth hormones according to their sex. I mean, like, it just goes on and on. I mean, you, it's, it's just not a, it's just, that's just not a fix. It's just not. Oh, I mean, I was simply going to say, and not to mention the uh, social issues this would stress with having a forced castrated, like, sect of society. Yeah, the, the society of eunuchs. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it's not a fix. Right, and then but, I um, see hmm. the issues with, again, this going back to the amount of decisions that parents have in their own children. It's like, can you imagine having been born and someone tells you when you're old enough to understand, you will never have children of your own. <laughs> like, that's got to be... Yeah, just, Shane, good luck. That seems like that would be incontinence <laughs> and, uh, or is incontinence the word I'm looking for? 
No, no that's, that's when that's... you crap your pants, <laughs> bun. That's when you pee yourself. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, basically, um, uh, being sterile would seem like one of the problems that we would want to fix with genetic editing. And yet we turn around and say, let's introduce this as almost like a punitive measure for people who will end up doing that on their children, no less, not even on themselves. But not to mention mm. still, who's going to enforce that rule? Should we really allow the state to dictate hypothetically what you could do in the scenario where you could do something like this level of genetic editing at what yeah, point yeah, do we and limit speaking, at what point do we limit parent like ability to do stuff i mean where are all these lines drawn it's just a pandora's box of all these what's the word i'm looking for here like God waterfalls awful problems. Problems. the only thing i could like reasonably compare a breakthrough of this, like, size two would be l quite literally splitting the atom. Huh? And, mm -hmm. I mean, look at where we are now, like, almost a hundred years from when we first split the atom huh? ethically on how we even, like, control these things that we've created as a result of that. So I, I think that claim that Tanner just made about, like, the state influencing uh, choice in that regard, I think that's the straw that breaks the camel's back as far as uh, I'm concerned with the argument. For me, personally, I'm very, I, I don't know if I call it anti-state, but I do dislike the idea of, the, of, of anyone else telling me what I can and can't do. I'm still struggling with it. So still struggling with how to solve this issue without being a totalitarian. Uh, it's a terrifying thought. Because here's a fundamental issue uh, that we're about to run into. The, 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 we're we're barreling towards state. it. What would you say, Stephen? Oh, I was, I was just making a joke about how, you know, what we're talking about is creating a deep genetic state. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> An ethno state. Very nice. Yeah, it's a deep we're genetic state. look like Kim state. Kardashian. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. And that's my chief concern. It's. I don't know how to control uh, for this issue that will arise without also turning us into the thing that I despise the most, a sort of authoritarianism. It's difficult. It's it's horrifying, really. Yeah, you know, it's I, pretty rough. I don't know why I even just thought about this, but I, you know, I have a much older sister who has had uh, four children now, and I think back about some of the conversations that she had with my mom whenever she was pregnant with her first child. And I remember all of those, you can find them everywhere online and, and stuff, but those things about, well, if you do this while you're pregnant at this time, you know, you're more likely to have a boy or you're more likely to have a girl if you do this. And how, like, people are really on board with that stuff, you know? Like, they are totally like, yeah, I'm going to, I don't know, lay on my back and do five sit-ups and drink way too much orange juice well, so that I have a... Juice. What's up? I said, well, we are naturally superstitious. So. Well, yeah. Humans, I mean. But, I mean, like, all sort of these, you know, old wives' tale kind of things, and people, like, latch onto that, and they're like, yeah, well, we're really trying for a, a boy, or we're really trying for a girl. I mean, like, I, I, the, like you guys said earlier, the, the possibility that this becomes something in the future, I think, is much more than a possibility. Um, and so taking the conversation to, well, when it does happen inevitably, what is the state's role in something like that is a good conversation. Um, me personally, I'm not an anti-state person per se. Um, obviously, I'm not a let's have the government do literally everything. But um, as I said earlier in the uh, in the podcast, uh, you know, I think it's the state or the government's responsibility to ensure the well-being of its citizens and so that comes into play when we're talking about possible modifications to babies that are going to be born and those modifications doing things that could affect their well-being in the future or their potential for well-being which may be a completely different category than straight up affecting well-being uh, because I would uh, I would hope I was going to say I would assume and I, I would hope that if this was something that became widely available that you know the concerns that Stephen brought up earlier about well if we touch a few of these buttons over here who knows what else that's going to affect I would hope that we would have figured 
at least a little bit of that out before we just let loose on the public with that sort of uh, capability. Yeah. You know that we yeah. won't. I mean, you know, think about all the medications you can buy at a gas station that are completely unapproved. Oh, right. Or that or just have now. huge warning labels on them like, this may affect your child's potential for xyz unknown or look mm. at how mm. mayor, the mayor corporation oh. sold that uh uh what was it that uh clotting factor medication for free bleeders in like the 80s that was heavily contaminated with a uh, hiv hmm? oh Oof. yeah we don't have the and best track they, uh, they, were, a... they no. were found out got sued into the dirt uh by multiple european countries but then continued to sell that same tainted medication in uh, like South American countries or in African countries. So, and why not? They're poor. They're not human. I mean, we all know that. Exactly. <laughs> I really hope we have the kind of audience who dig irony. Uh, I really hope that or uh, sarcasm. <laughs> I'm really I'm heavy really on sarcasm here. Yes. We haven't well established a lot of it yet, but it'll come in time. <laughs> yeah, just take just take exactly what I said out of context. Make it right. a looping, you know, <laughs> short video. <laughs> I'm gonna put it on our Instagram. Yeah, I, I was gonna put that right on there. <laughs> I'm gonna get a soundboard with uh, Steve isms and just have every single one of them on a key, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, so what we gotta yeah. do is put it on a T-shirt. I, I can see a T-shirt with the <laughs> Stevens glance directly to the left, and, and a whole bunch of Steve isms directly below it. I can see. This. Yeah, it's in my mind's eye. Featured prominently, it has to be. You know, I'm the fakest, wokest, whitest <laughs> man alive. <laughs> it's true. False. He glows in the dark. <laughs> so let know. me let me ask this because uh, this is something I made a note of earlier, but we didn't really come around to it. So I, I at this point we would be. I'm trying to angle this the right way. Literally, what I have written down is in. vaccines <laughs> versus designer, because we've talked about something, for example, like HIV, which currently there is no cure per se. Uh, you know, we can't stab somebody with a needle and suddenly HIV is, is no more. That is one way of taking care of essentially the main uh, part of why this would ever even be supported in the first place other than those designer elements like i said already the main reason and sort of the only reason that i even lean towards supporting something like this is because of the possibility that it could eradicate things that we have issues with like if you know you could edit it say in 2019 we could have somehow edited everybody's genes to uh you know be completely resistant to covid and any of its variants you know, it seems like that yeah, would have a... been a good thing to do. However, that has so much, so many more implications, it seems, after our conversations, uh, as opposed to jabbing them with a needle as in a vaccine. So is that the way that we simply stick to dealing with things like disease? It's worth well, so. Over. But once again, I hate, I really hate to bring this up. Uh, it's just not that simple. <laughs> Um, it's, I was just about to say, this is one of those things that's so rich, we wouldn't be able to even touch it. I know, I know, and this is why it's great for me, because this is, I mean, my notes are so elementary over here, like, everything has a question mark next to it, because I'm just so ignorant. Uh -huh. So, so these, these are excellent questions, and by the way, look, I'm not a geneticist either, I'm just, you know, highly educated on, on, you know, chemistry and, yeah. and, you know, this stuff. So, so here's the deal, Okay. So I can't, I couldn't find supporting evidence for it um, yesterday or today in preparation for this uh, podcast show. But I swear to you, I swear, because I've been talking about this ever since, I, I, that um, when I took genetics, the instructor was was trying to tell us something very profound about genetics. And of course, most of the people in there were slack jawed and just like, were not even there. Like, you know, no one was home. You know what I mean? Mm. But. I was hearing this dude. He had a lot to say. And uh, so take a disease. By the way, what does that word mean? Disease. Diseased. That's literally what it means. You are you are not at ease. Okay. Take the disease cystic fibrosis, right? It's a terrible disease where um, your life expectancy is in your 20s. You have hardened um, mucus in your lungs forever. And your parents have to beat it out of you as a child. You know, it's just, it's bad. It's just that bad. The, the, the complex issue 
is that okay? Well, let's just uh, let's just gene vaccinate against cystic fibrosis. That seems like a great idea. The the genes that control, so so to speak, control. I'm using that word loosely there. Control for cystic fibrosis are the ones that tell your your digestive system like how to operate, like you know what what mucus to to secrete in order for you to be able to live and and so on. So. It's just not that simple. The best way to uh, help yourself, I mean, you know, obviously you can't do this, but the best way to prevent genetic disease is to just make sure your parents aren't related. If, if, if people would do that, if people would just do that, a lot of genetic disease would just go away. I'm not <laughs> saying all of them, because, of course, I don't know about all of them. But uh, Brothers, that is sisters, just... moms, dads, don't do it. <laughs> Like you have two, you have two alleles, um, you know, two working genetic components for like everything, and the only way that you end up with a really bad disease usually, because of course, once again, I don't know all of them, but the number one way you end up with a bad disease is because both of your alleles, the both of your alleles are not so called defective, but just not working. They're they're not doing their intended uh function it, it's also not that it's also not that simple either but for now let's just say they're not doing their intended function and so you have two copies if one of them's doing their intended function you're fine in fact one of the thing one of the things i tell my students all the time it's like you know in a room of 30 people a lot of us a lot of us have genetic coding for really bad diseases but why aren't any of us suffering from them well because we have a working copy somewhere this this really connects to something I mentioned just to you three the other day about like uh, life uh, lifespan for uh, based on the sexes male and female and why for whatever reason not just across uh, in humans but across most species males live less uh, lengthy lifespans than uh, females do. It, it was really interesting and and like I already mentioned earlier and Tanner uh, deduced just from like a summary, um, just from like an, uh, an explanation of symptoms or like reasons as for why, it, it's all. It's due to the fact that uh, males are missing that extra X chromosome, and that can lead to uh, a very serious uh, chromosome that plays a very fundamental effect in gene expression, or in the, or in just the, just across cells, just cell work. And it, whenever you have one of them missing, or you just don't have that redundant X, you just have issues. You just have issues with gene expression. Yep, yep. It, the pillow along, is gone. Along with, the, uh... the defensive mechanism is gone. Yeah, along with um, mitochondrial issues. So we inherit 100% of our mitochondria from our mother. So if our mother is a carrier for mitochondrial you know, problems, that means that males are the ones who suffer because they don't have that uh, uh, other possibility. It, it's it's really interesting, all of it. It really is. There's all this speaking of genetics, and, and I... And I, all this just is, is just based on the, or all of this just underlie, underlies the claim that you just shouldn't sleep with your sister. But I do think it is interesting to discuss and, and, and very important. And uh, uh, here's a kind of a complete aside. And, and I, oh, Tanya, you got something? Yeah, um, that, that it's, it's not a claim. We do not condone sleeping with your sister. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, if anything, I just told you as to why you shouldn't, you know? That's a very factual mm -hmm. thing you shouldn't do. So, so here's another thing. I, I kind of brought it up really briefly at the start. But uh, there's this book I read a, a long time ago uh, by a science fiction author uh, named Arthur C. Clarke, who uh, was around during like, the golden age of science fiction. My favorite mm -hmm. science fiction author. He, I love his work so much. He wrote one book called uh, Songs, uh, The Songs of Distant Earth, I believe it was called. Almost certain that's what it was called. And it had a beautiful plot, and and I bring it up for the following reason: inside of this uh, book, essentially, uh, mankind, uh, the entire Earth, was about to be destroyed on Earth. Uh, the Earth was going to be destroyed. The su there was going to the sun was going to supernova, and they just didn't have the time it would take to put life on other planets in the what you and I consider conventional means. So instead, uh, really interesting. He, cr he uh, came up with this idea, Arthur C. Clarke, of these ships, uh, sort of drone ships, completely dead matter, that would uh, travel, not at the speed of light, uh, completely impos uh, impossible as far as he was concerned, or at the very least for the world that he had built. 
he was very interested in he wanted realism uh, as close to or as close as he could with his stories which is why i love him so yeah, much. yeah we're, we're talking we're talking about a science fiction not a science fantasy you know what i mean Yes, exactly. That's a that's a great distinction, and that's exactly what the distinction is here. This isn't Star Wars. This is speculative, and he right. had this idea of creating these drone ships that were were completely full of dead matter. Uh, he may have used the idea of uh, of like a of uh, like having uh, frozen eggs, but essentially what he did is he had these drone ships with inner, inert matter go over to the closest adjacent planets that could support life, and then more or less just these drones, these AI, would just structurally create humans uh, and everything that's yeah, required people. that humans require animals uh plant life all those sort of things just from inert matter and then he would then lay them upon these uh, these drones would then lay them upon these planets as a way of promulgating uh, mankind or the, the hu humanity the human species and it was when i read that when i saw that that became to me the most incredibly obvious way of doing that of of sort of doing this whole space colonization thing this thing that so many people are thinking about, this whole Occupy Mars, this Leave Earth, this let's go check out uh, all these stars, let's do all this. It seems to me like such a simple, uh, not, if not simple, then incredibly intuitive solution to the problem of just trying to make humans go arc all the way over to other planets. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that it was ludicrous, that, I, that it never had occurred to me, or you just don't see it in most uh, speculative sci-fis out there. It just seems like such a good solution to this problem, and I think that's the real, the real like rub of what of what designer babies are all about, and why this could be so incredible, and why this could be so positive. I mean, imagine this: imagine centuries time from now, uh, we send a drone to another planet, it reads the planet, and it just goes, "Okay, there's kind of a lot of like chlorine up in this or, uh, up on this planet. Uh, humans can't really deal with that, but what if we just sort of alter it a bit, you know, just a little bit, and have uh, these new humanoids on this planet?" And instead of having to terraform an entire planet, like a single drone ship to terraform an entire planet, all you have to do is just modify humanity or what it means to be human, just a slight bit. And to me, it's like it's an incredible idea, and and like the 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 ability to just sort of go around and do it like that instead. And I think that sort of underlies how incredible this could be, uh, how incredible or how. This could be the next fire, you know? This could be the next discovery of fire or archery or whatever it is you want to call it. Yeah, or, sure. or learning how to walk upright or language. I think, it could be I think we all, literally the de defining moment. I think we all agree that the possibilities are endless because they are. Mm -hmm. But just yeah. like the death of the gods in Pandora's box, there's just no way to know. Mm. Are we all ready to wrap up? Well, it seems that so. way. Unless anybody has a particular opinion that they would like to spout off and complain about. I mean, I know Brayton's over there, like, itching to be like, okay, Steve, so I've got this other plot, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, I, I really enjoy a lot of what's been said, and, you know, I wish I had more to say on the topic, but I think when it comes down to it, it it's just one of those problems. It's like... Um, it's like in one of the later Harry Potter books when they go to Gringotts uh, to get one of the last Horcruxes and the entire room is charmed to where every time you touch something, it multiplies. That's mm -hmm. what this issue feels like. That's the Pandora's box. Is yes. Because once you do uh, something to one thing, it suddenly becomes a million different other benefits or uh, hindrances. or You know, it it is like... Steven said endless uh however that's yeah, never you know, stopped it's a bit us like playing a game before. of yeah <laughs> yeah go ahead <laughs> true yeah yeah it's a bit like ga playing a game of chess where you want to understand how the rook works but as soon as you move that rook piece all the other pieces start moving too you'll never be able to actually wrap your head around it because there's so many multivariate things at play like like let's say there's a room of a thousand different light switches and you want to understand what each light switch does whenever you flip one light switch a hundred thousand other ones go down or go up or go this way go that, that way uh, and each one of those activates a different light switch it's the skyrim you puzzle know? you won't actually be able to play the game it's yeah a, exactly you won't be able to play this game <laughs> because it's just I, too complicated yeah, there are too many pieces at work it's, it's wild i can't i can't stress this for those of us who are listening brothers and sisters right it's speculated i think it, or at least it was speculated but the number of games of chess you could possibly make where the board state doesn't even repeat. In other words, non-repeating games 
is like 10 to the 120. That's more than the number of observable particles in the universe. Okay. Cool. What we're talking about would dwarf that number completely. There's so mm -hmm. much locked within the DNA molecule. It's truly absurd. I mean, like, you know, I will say this early and often, the universe is not indebted to us to make sense. And uh, this is one area where it's like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. The universe is literally telling you, I, I don't care if you understand it or not. Like, here's the replicator. Bye. Hey, you know? It's it's kind of terrifying, uh, the space between, like, the space of this, you know? It's like we're going from a pond that felt pretty big at the time into not even an ocean, but quite literally all of hu all of space. It, 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 there's there's just uh, it, it's really hard to express yourself in it because there, you, there's nothing to grapple uh, hold on to and go. Well, this will stay the same. There's nothing that will stay the same. It, it's all functionally different. Do you think that uh, you know a long time from now there'll be uh, super far in the future memes? You know how we have now uh, that are like let me go back and it's the picture of the uh first uh like <laughs> amphibious species to come on water that's the ancestor for human beings but it's it's us you know about to it's like a picture of us discovering the ability to edit our <laughs> our genome yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, a, it's a black and white picture of watson and crick uh <laughs> doing the x-ray crystallography of the of the genome and it's like take us back take you know back. something went wrong some guy shoots them both in the head yeah yeah somebody crick, stop no. this we're in the bad timeline where watson and crick discovered the double helix <laughs> i i think oh uh, yeah I, I think there will never be a time or where all of us uh, at one point or another don't look back and lament our own existence. I think that's just written in. I do that I daily. I think part of life is the trials. Yeah, exactly. See, Brayden can relate to this. He does it every day. You know, a part of reality is the trials and tribulations that it that it is. It's it's horrifying. All of life, all of it is. It's terrifyingly horrible. Every moment of every day, if you let it be, if you just focus in on this one aspect of it, it's true. In the same way that you could like find God in an ashtray. You could also find endless suffering in every single way of visualizing reality. It's all horrible. All of it is. It's also all completely, <laughs> utterly beautiful. It's all of these things. You can evaluate it in any way you want. It's the greatest show on earth. It'll, you know? It's the greatest show on earth. It's literally the most horrifying thing you will ever experience. And it is quite literally ceaselessly horrifying. Uh, it just depends on the way you want to posit questions. or It depends on the way you want to look at it. And it, it's, it doesn't seem to me that we'll ever not lament our own existence. We'll, we'll never have a moment where we don't really wish we could still be toads, you know, mm -hmm. just croaking and, and, and being completely oblivious to the fact that we croak. Yeah, I mean, of course, of course, what you're brushing upon for those of us listening is it's always a fight against the rational versus the irrational, right? In other words, we can only do so much in our, our small corners, you know what I mean? So we should try to endeavor to do what's rational. See, everybody thought they were going to the store to, you know, pick up a blonde hair, blue eyed gene for their child. And really, they were just lamenting their own existence the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we're always doing, aren't we? Let me get the well, uh, that... let me get the be... six foot tall, uh, five feet wide uh, DLC for my uh, for my child. Mm -hmm. I edit my baby because I hate myself. I mean, why else? Yep. Yeah, yeah. and I think that might be a fun place to end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sure. so designer babies, everyone. What a topic. Uh, I think we'll go around and yep. kind of offer up some closing remarks here. Uh, I'll go ahead and, I guess, uh, start us off wrapping it up. Um, honestly, the best summation that I can give for this is going to be still that I think the and this uh, obviously speculative obviously there's a lot of strings attached here the most strings possible even some are saying <laughs> in a perfect world where we could push a button so to speak and eliminate the possibility for human beings to contract HIV to uh, you know be diagnosed with various forms of cancer and other debilitating life-threatening diseases 
you know, X, Y, Z, check all the boxes, all that stuff. In a perfect world, the ability for us to edit the genome and prevent those things from happening would be fantastic. Uh, it's, it's simply put the ability to snap your fingers and prevent a almost endless amount of suffering, uh, which we've already described. Trevor so adequately put it, uh, is sort of daily life sometimes. So, so to me, the ability to do that would be unparalleled, uh, like discovering fire. However, we have come to the realization that that's not exactly the case. There is so much more under the surface of this problem and this topic than meets the eye. So to me, as inevitable as it seems, I kind of just have to sit back and say, you know, I'm here for the ride. I think it'd be great if we could use it ethically and that would be the limit, but as I'm sure most of you agree, the potential for this thing to get out of control is nigh inevitable. Yeah, that's that's me on, on that. I would close by saying the only other closest analog in scale I can possibly give for the implications this would have on humanity is literally the splitting of the atom. It ushered in an entire new era dominated by both the incredibly unpredictable oblivion on one hand of the scale, and then on the other, you know, getting us the ability to go out and stretch beyond our own, like, planet, you know? or let alone our own solar system, with just the limitless, boundless energy we can get from literally matter itself. I mean, look at us. I mean, like I said previously, in the nearly 100 years since we split the atom and how it divided the world and how we came to the brink of total human extinction on, like, multiple occasions in the from the 40s all the way up until, like, the, the late 1990s. I mean, we had to collectively come together as a, a species and decide, hey, we need to, like, chill out, or we're going to, like, selfishly, for our own stupid interests, destroy everything. And I think that's what something like this would take, is overcoming innate human selfishness to use this for personal gain or fear or power. And I frankly don't know if we're capable of that because we've shown even now after all these things that happened in the 20th century have come and passed that we're going back down that road again. I mean, we're in a state now where we, the U.S., are like re-nuclear arming our arsenal to compete with the rest of the world doing the same thing. I mean, I don't think global tensions have been this high since the 50s or the 60s, huh? And I just... I mean... Right, you know, we might we we might be heading towards a time frame where we have an Iranian genetic deal, you know. I, exactly. Damn. I mean, swap the word nuclear for genetic. I mean, that's roughly what I'm trying to get at. But I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's my. Guess. Well, uh, I mean, I can go next. Mine's short. Read Jurassic Park. It's not about dinosaurs. It's about humans. All right, that was short. You got you got us there. My well, God, he surprised this entire thing. What? He did. He did. I thought it was just too. about Jeff this Goldblum man. looking real nice and sweaty and sexy in a <laughs> black. <laughs> yeah, it's all you know? Toyota <laughs> Goldblum. We know that. It's looking... the suggestive shirt that sells it. It's too good. But uh, here, I would, I would end it on this. So the thing I said earlier, like it's built in, like one of the things that's built into our nature is the is suffering, or built into reality as far as you and I can even tell or even touch, uh, touch upon is suffering and, ter and the terrible nature and how horrifying all this is. But just to layer in a little bit more on how strange and multivariate this problem is, not even that is could be true. Uh, not even that. We're, we're talking about the changing what humans fundamentally are in any sort of possible way. Uh, even the most fundamental nature of reality, the way that you and I approach things in terms of suffering, not suffering, light, requisite darkness, all of these things that you and I take is baked into the cake. Uh, even those things become unriveted to the floor. You know, like talk about, you know, let's steal everything that's not, you know, bolted to the floor. So this, this problem unbolts everything from the floor. There isn't a floor. 
everything is fundamentally unfastened. Uh, the things that you and I take as most fundamental to what life fundamentally is. I mean, I keep saying fundamental because it breaks so into it. It's fundamental. It really digs into what it is. It, it's <laughs> it's course, horrifying. Of course, Trevor, of course, Trevor, you're correct. I mean, we are literally genetic machines. That's what we do. We are the thing that protects I mean, the DNA. When we talk about, like, when we use these words and we throw around these, like, analogies, what, what we're working with are these things that exist within our mind states composed of neurons, of our brains. And we're talking about changing humans. So those brains, which generate these concepts and abstractions, everything changes. The way you perceive changes, I don't know. Uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It's quite literally unknown. Not even the act of changing it is known. It's completely, completely gray. Uh, there's there's not even color to attribute to it, really. It's it's completely outside of our present ability to explain. And it's it's going to be one of those things that we just will not know or understand until we start to feel around the room. I feel like you and I and all four of us are just sort of talking about how fucking crazy the next room over is. We're getting our flashlights out. We're about to run in there and try to do what we can. And we're going to try to feel the corners of that room. And I don't know if no, we're all going to die as soon as we enter into that room. But it's no, going to, we, it's what we, we are, need to do next. Yeah, we, we are in one cave system with the light mm. shining in it and about to go to the next. I mean, you know. Yes, <laughs> and, that's, oh, that's what's oh, happening. You know. and that's exactly what it is. I never, I never expected that designer babies could lead to such an expansive, you know, consideration of the human existence. Educate that self. Everything <laughs> goes down to that. I, I just never really traveled that far down that path before. So thank you for it's entertaining. It leads every time. Like it's not, it's not just this top. Like all roads it's not lead every to existence. Topic this topic in particular goes all the way down. Existential dread is just something that follows, man. That's it, just the a general attribute to these things. It permeates. Did Kierkegaard kill himself? I don't recall. No, I think he... Well, now we have to look that up. Let me see. <laughs> Regardless, all, all paths lead <laughs> to the same realization existentially. And some people break, and others are willing to fight against the, the struggle. And I think that's what makes humanity. Well... You know, Brayton, you should sign us off. I, how did we end the last episode? <laughs> I think it just ended. <laughs> <laughs> As all things do. <laughs> I mean, you know, As all say things something. Do. Oh. Four, we should read a poem. Right. Someone read a poem. <laughs> uh, do not go gentle into that good night. <laughs> Oh my god, right? I was just about to I just looked it up. Alright, I have it right here. I just pulled it up, you fucking asshole. Alright. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And I think that'll that's good right there. Couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself. Join us on the next episode of Four that's Mortal it. Coils. Uh we'll see you there. Until next time. Until next time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>